Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be speaking here today. As I was saying to Felicity earlier, um, the last time I was in the Royal Society was when I was being interviewed for my PhD scholarship. So this is a very nice uh, occasion to return to. Now, in talking about alchemy today, I want to stress variety. When we think about alchemy, we very often think of transformation of change, specifically the transmutation of base metals into gold. As I hope to convince you today, there was a little bit more to alchemy than that, particularly in the 16th century, which is the period I'm going to primarily focus on today. When I talk about variety, I mean variety in the goals and pursuits of alchemy, in the occupations of its practitioners, and in the way that its often mysterious processes were reinterpreted and decoded. Alchemy was not a monolithic entity, and all alchemists did not look like this. <laughs> Alchemy was practiced by courtiers and artisans, physicians and priests, merchants and scholars. Practitioners from a range of backgrounds were nevertheless concerned to present themselves as heirs to a single, unified and ancient tradition of privileged knowledge, as opposed to the charlatans and ignoramuses who knew nothing of the true art. For all their personal diversity, individual alchemists often adopted similar styles of self-presentation, by appealing to long-established conventions, not only of technical writing, but also of poetry and art. And I'm going to illustrate a few of my points with reference to this spectacular art object, uh, one of a group of alchemical scrolls known as the Ripley Scrolls. And you'll be hearing a bit more about Ripley and why they might be called the Ripley Scrolls as I go on. Um, so at the very top of the Ripley Scroll, we have a philosopher who is overseeing the entire work. And below, he shows us in the centre of this roundel um, how the alchemical work should proceed. Interestingly, he's teaching out of a book to his disciple. And this is one of the key ways in which alchemical knowledge was supposed to be passed on. Uh, not through publicising it to the ignorant masses, but through privileged communication to a carefully chosen apprentice. And it often took place through encoded processes. On the surface, it's not easy to find out what's happening in an image like this. And whatever the alchemist saw inside his flask, it surely cannot have been the bodies of small figures dissolving uh, and producing a third uh, being out of themselves. But I think one way of exploring this mass of material and the range of ideas, practices and practitioners of early modern alchemy but also the things that they had in common, is to look at proposals for patronage. <coughs> Alchemical processes often required long hours, perplexing instructions, expensive materials, and a lot of reading. In fact, it's a little bit like being a historian. And like historians, alchemists were continually concerned about funding. Unless they were independently wealthy, and some were, it made sense to find a patron who was willing to finance the alchemical enterprise, who might even offer a post at court, or in a noble household. The benefits, of course, went both ways. In Tudor England, monarchs, nobles, and highly placed officials were all tempted by the promise of elixirs able to prolong life or transmute metals. Both Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, for instance, supported alchemists. The suits presented to these, patient, these patrons provide the ultimate in alchemical self-presentation. They are often accompanied by gifts, in the form of alchemical treatises or other curiosities, possibly including the Ripley scroll, and they often <coughs> promise very specific returns on investment. Above all, practitioners were keen to convince their audiences that what they offered was the real deal, workable practices tested and honed by practical experience, but also grounded in a deep understanding of natural philosophy, and thus able to appeal to the intellect as well as to the pocket of a prospective patron. Patronage suits teaches, teaches not only about the diversity of alchemical exp expertise available in early modern England, but also, crucially, about why its practitioners believed it would work, why it was therefore worth supporting. So a little bit of background. Alchemy arrived in the Latin West around the mid-12th century in the form of Latin translations of Arabic treatises, some of which were themselves um, adapted from Greek originals. From the beginning, this transmission of knowledge was associated with the idea, if not the reality, of royal patronage. 
the first known Latin translation of an Arabic alchemical treatise is the Liber de Compositione Alchimiae, the book of the composition of alchemy, translated in 1144 with a few adjustments for its target audience. So it describes um, how a Christian hermit, Morianus, teaches alchemy to the Muslim prince Khalid. You can see what they're doing there. Another translation from the Arabic was the famous pseudo-Aristotelian Secretum Secretorum, the secret of secrets. This pseudonymous work was framed as a letter from Aristotle to his pupil, Alexander the Great. In it, Aristotle teases the king with a riddle, which I don't have. Therefore, take the animal, vegetable, and mineral stone, the which is no stone, nor hath the nature of a stone. This riddle signifies the ubiquity of the prima materia, the starting point of the work, which is found in all things and is composed of all four Aristotelian elements. Over time, this idea was adapted into a trope for distinguishing specific products of the alchemist's art, each with a different application or form of preparation. We can already see here on the Ripley scroll three different objectives, the white stone which creates silver, the red stone which creates gold, and the elixir vitae, which prolongs your life. But according to the animal vegetable mineral scheme, the philosopher's stone could be made in different ways. A key text here is the late 14th century treatise, the Epistola Acetationis, or the Book of Abbreviations, pseudonymously attributed to the philosopher Raymond Lull. This work is also framed as a letter from a philosopher to a king. In this case, it's from Raymond to King Robert of Sicily, in which Raymond describes how to abbreviate the process for making three different kinds of stone, animal, vegetable, and mineral, each one using a different solvent in its manufacture. So the mineral stone is made using a corrosive mineral acid. Because that's highly toxic, the resulting elixir cannot be ingested. It's therefore useless for medicine. However, the vegetable stone is made using vinegar derived from grapes. It's therefore safe to drink, and it can prolong your life. Finally, the animal stone was made using blood. And this approach has left its mark uh, on a number of texts and images in 15th century English alchemy, including the Ripley scroll. For example, we can see here, this is from a different version of the scroll, a red lion and a green one. The lions uh, symbolise the two main pursuits of alchemy, health and wealth. The green lion is usually taken to represent vitriol, which in our modern chemical language is iron or copper sulphate, used for making the mineral stone capable of transmuting base metals into gold or silver. The red line, however, was red lead, used for making the vegetable stone, a medicinal elixir able to transform sick bodies into healthy ones. I'm going to focus, for most of this talk, on the vegetable stone, an extremely interesting application which hasn't been very much studied. To begin with, how do you actually make a vegetable stone? In England, it seems that many alchemists learned about this approach from the famous English alchemist George Ripley, canon of Bridlington, who died about 1490. Ripley was a devotee of works attributed to Raymond Lull, including the Epistola Acetationis that I mentioned just now. Ripley's own treatise, the Medulla Alchimiae, or Marrow of Alchemy, dated to 1476, adopts the threefold structure of transmutational mineral stone, medicinal vegetable stone, and mysteriously multifunctional animal stone. Indeed, Ripley actually assigns a chapter to each one of these stones. His chapter on the vegetable stone contains only one highly significant recipe. It describes how to make a special vegetable menstruum, which is called the ignis naturae, or natural fire, used to prepare an elixir both transmutational and medicinal. And just to confuse matters, he calls it the green lion, but as we see, he's not talking about vitriol. Um, as Ripley claims, this substance, I quote, has the power of turning all bodies into pure gold and of healing all infirmities, more than the potions of Hippocrates and Galen, for this is the true potable gold and none other. Ripley provides instructions on how to draw a vegetable mercury from an imperfect metal, which he calls sericon. So here's my translation. Take the sharpest humidity of grapes, distilled, and in it dissolve the body well calcined into red, which by masters is called sericon, etc., etc. 
Although the key ingredients in this recipe, the metallic calx and its solvent, are not clearly defined, we can decode them. The sharpest humidity of grapes distilled is distilled vinegar made from wine. The body, well calcined into red, is, is um, the prime matter of this particular experiment, a metallic body also called sericon. And in alchemical texts of the 15th century, it's usually glossed as minium, or red lead. Again, in modern chemical speak, a lead oxide, which is able to be dissolved in vinegar. Here is minium. So we can also see minium referred to, I think, in the Ripley scroll itself. You'll notice that this alchemical king and queen are actually standing in a bath and eating of the juice of grapes. This is a handy way of allegorising the dissolution of metallic bodies in strong vinegar made from wine. And that's how you get to your elixir vitae, as well as transmutational methods. So the solution that you get from dissolving your lead in vinegar is heated until a thick gum remains in the bottom of the glass. When you distill it, this gum yields a vapour, the fumus albus, or white smoke, which you can collect in a receiver and condense to form a, a liquid. This liquid eventually is used to make a powerful corrosive, which is supposedly able to dissolve gold and silver and hence make potable gold for medicinal purposes. But owing to the particular circumstances of its manufacture, this liquid combined both mineral and vegetable qualities. In this form, it was regarded as being a safe and legitimate product for human consumption, and it therefore provided the basis for the elixir of life. However, it could also be combined with the mineral stone, a corrosive mixture of, of uh, vitriol, cinnabar, and saltpetre, to produce a powerful transmutational elixir. I will refer to this alchemical approach as seroconian alchemy, after its main ingredient, the imperfect metal sericon. And some of you may have noticed a flaw in the plan. Um, this is a medicinal elixir which is made using lead compounds, so it probably wasn't terribly good for you. But we can at least see the attraction of sericonian alchemy in its range of applications. You can transmute metals with it, you can manufacture pearls and other gems, but it also provided the basis of an alchemical therapeutics capable of healing sickness, restoring youth, and prolonging life. And it's the promise of the latter that seems to have prompted George Ripley to compose the medulla in the first place. Although his longest chapter is devoted to the mineral stone, the text actually assigns more value to medicinal products. And it's likely in this respect that Ripley was trying to cater his work towards the requirements of a particular audience. The work is attributed to George Neville, Edward IV's disgraced Archbishop of York. Following a spell of imprisonment in France, Neville's health was failing, and Ripley consequently assigns more value to the therapeutic aspects of his work, particularly the vegetable stone. His introductory verses to the poem, which are here in a mid-16th century translation, drop a heavy hint. If thou unbroken long wouldst keep in perfect health thy vessel still, then for thy cannon look thou seek, Remember him that hath good will. Unfortunately for Ripley, however, it was already too late for the bishop's vessel. Neville died in 1476, the year of the medulla's composition, and he, and he may never have received it. However, the value of the three stones model as both a framing device for treatises and as a convenient way of outlining different alchemical products may be gauged by its continuing appearance in English patronage proposals throughout the 16th century. In England, alchemical enthusiasts had a particular problem. They faced a legal prohibition against practising their art. Henry IV's statute against multiplying metals made it a felony to try to reproduce gold alchemically. The need to secure a licence to practise doubtless underlies the large number of proposals for alchemical projects directed to the monarch and royal councillors. This is particularly noticeable during the reign of Elizabeth I, who reigned 1558-1603, when numerous suitors applied both to the Queen and to her secretary and later Lord Treasurer, William Cecil Lord Burley. Burley, struggling with both a national bullion shortage and chronic gout, was deeply interested in both the transmutational and medicinal possibilities of alchemy. And we can see from the range of people who applied to him and the Queen, uh, 
just how um, alchemy seems to transcend social boundaries. We see, for instance, Edward Craddock, the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at the University of Oxford in 1565, who wrote works in both English and Latin on the Philosopher's Stone, complete with a lengthy dedication to the Queen in Latin verse. The gentleman Samuel Norton wrote his own treatise for the Queen. And petitioners were also willing to take risks. In 1565, the alchemist Thomas Charnock, an unlicensed medical practitioner, wrote to Elizabeth with another treatise. He was so certain of his process that he staked his head on the results, volunteering to be confined within the Tower of London as surety for his pledge to manufacture the Philosopher's Stone. He later recorded his dissatisfaction at learning that his proposal had been set aside while Lord Burley investigated the claims of another alchemist, the Dutchman Cornelius de Lannoy, or Alneto. Yet perhaps Charnock was the lucky one. After repeated setbacks, including constant complaints about the quality of English glassware, it was de Lannoy rather than Charnock who ended up in the tower, something he certainly didn't volunteer for. That suitors came from all walks of life is also illustrated by the London haberdasher, Richard Walton, who was active in the 1560s. He composed his own alchemical letter to Elizabeth I. Although Walton's original letter has not survived, at least I haven't found it in the state papers, a copy is preserved in a 17th century manuscript, British Library Manuscript Sloan 3654. This text preserves Walton's petition for an alchemical license, and his appeal for more tangible forms of support, since, he says, the keeping of my house is so costly that I shall not be able to go through with the charges thereof. He then considers why it pleases God to grant the true knowledge of alchemy to poor subjects rather than to kings directly. For I have not read, he says, since the conquest that any manner of king had it. Although that Raymond Lully was in King Edward III's time, and Ripley in and King Edward IV's time, and Norton, this is Thomas Norton, 15th century alchemist, in the latter end of um, King Edward IV and King Richard's time, and King Henry VII's time, yet none of all of these taught it to any of these kings. Thus it pleaseth God to bestow his great grace upon pure and simple men, such as seemeth the outcasts of all men, that they should cast themselves down at the feet of their princes and commonwealth. Now, you'll have noticed that Ripley, of course, is mentioned in this list of alchemists, but Ripley's influence is evident elsewhere in Walton's letter as well. Walton borrows several phrases, unattributed, from the preface to Ripley's medulla, in which the canon is justifying himself to his own patron, Neville. The similarity suggests that Ripley's authority might be in, deployed in more ways than one, here as an epistolary model. Walton's vaguely, vaguely worded proposal continues with a pledge to manufacture both the elixir of life and the elixir of metals, alluding to the green lion, white fume, and other staples of the Seraconian repertoire. It isn't clear whether Walton's letter was ever sent, but it does point to the aspirations of practitioners with social resources less obvious than those of the university-educated Craddock or the gently-born Samuel Norton. While Walton, Delanoy, and Charnock were competing for the right to practice and funds to do it with, for some petitioners, alchemy may have been a pretext for suits of another kind. Take, for example, the case of Humphrey Locke, who compiled an, an English prose treatise dedicated to Lord Burley. Locke's treatise is not particularly original. It's composed of uncredited extracts from earlier works, particularly Ripley's Medulla. <clears throat> In fact, Locke actually borrows the whole of uh, Ripley's chapter on the vegetable stone. The influence of the medulla is also apparent in the structure of Locke's treatise through its division into chapters on animal, vegetable and mineral stones. Peter Grund, who has dated the treatise to about 1572, has identified Locke as an English craftsman, possibly an engineer or builder, who in 1567 entered the service of the Tsar of Russia, Ivan Vasilievich, better known to us as Ivan the Terrible. In his letters, Locke complained of his treatment in Russia, particularly by the English ambassador, and asked for permission to return. In his case, alchemy offered something that money alone could not buy, 
a passport home. From a note in one copy of the treatise, we learn that he was hoping his alchemical mysteries might pique Burley's interest. He says, I quote, For when I compiled it, I meant to have sent it into England as a present and mediator to help me home out of Russia. Wherefore I made it the more dark that I might the sooner be sent for home for to do it myself. Sadly, the patronage game did not always work out well for those involved. We can tell this from some of the accounts of alchemical malpractice which litter English alchemical poetry, often composed by practicing alchemists who were, of course, trying to differentiate what they did from what the charlatans did. Bloomfield's Blossoms, a long English poem in Rhyme Royale, written in 1557 by the priest and alchemist William Bloomfield, who was active about 1529 to 1574, singles out several fraudulent English alchemists. The poem offers a kind of divine comedy, in which the poet is led by a succession of guides, first time, then Raymond Lull, to the camp of philosophy, encountering both true and false alchemists on the way. In addition to respectable philosophers like Raymond and Ripley, the dreamer encounters the charlatans. I won't read out the whole thing, but you can see that he's listing a number of unsuccessful practitioners. Bloomfield is here providing an illuminating record of contemporary alchemical practice. Some of these individuals may be identified. And there are clearly some wonderful lost stories here. So Sir John York, the York with Coates Gay on the top line, was undermaster of the Tower Mint under Edward IV. He managed to lose £4,000 of the king's money by speculating unwisely on the Antwerp Exchange. Clearly, alchemy wasn't the only high-risk strategy at this time. As for Richard Record, he was brother of the better-known mathematician Robert. Hugh Oldcastle, the first to write on double-entry accounting in English, also appears here. As far as I know, this is the only text that suggests he had alchemical leanings. <clears throat> but I'm going to focus... Um, just for a few minutes, on Little Master Eden, on the third line of the second verse. This is Richard Eden, of about 1520 to 1576, who later obtained patronage from Burley and others as a translator. But Eden clearly had alchemical interests as well. In the mid-16th century, he was hired as an in-house alchemist by Richard Wally, Chamberlain to Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector of England, during the minority of King Edward VI. Eden continued to perform alchemy for Wally while the latter was imprisoned following Somerset's downfall. Eventually, following an argument over his lack of results, he betrayed Wally for multiplication. Wally was arrested, although the charges of illegal multiplying were later dropped. But Eden's story provides an illuminating account of English alchemical patronage in practice. In December 1547, he had been offered the post of distiller of waters to Henry VIII, an appointment frustrated by the king's death the following year. In late 1549 or early 1550, he decided to try his fortune with the Earl of Warwick, a noted patron of natural philosophy. On the way, he fell in with Wally. And he says, I quote, Therewith I showed him a book which I had about me, touching these matters, written with my own hand, and gathered out of sundry authors, declaring further to him that, at the request of Sir John York, we remember him, I intended to present the book to, the, to my Lord of Warwick, now Duke of Northumberland. Thus we passed time reading and reasoning until we came to Greenwich, where we parted. This episode is interesting in several respects. It reveals the range of opportunities available to a resourceful practitioner in mid-16th century England, who might seek positions at court, at the mint, or in the household of a gentleman or aristocrat. Books also played an important part in these endeavours. Eden hoped that he could attract Warwick's attention with his own compilation of alchemical authorities, perhaps as a platform for his discursive talents. The same combination of reading and reasoning proved valuable in exciting Wally's interest. While we can only speculate on the contents of this book, it seems likely that Raymond Lull was well represented. Eden says that his practice included both, I quote, metals and quinta essentia. Uh, the quintessence is a medicinal elixir that's discussed in a number of pseudo-Lullian works. 
he goes on to describe his own attempt to replicate the work of Raymundus called Acutatio. This suggests that Eden, who was already skilled at distillation, was thinking of the recipe for the vegetable stone described in Raymond's Epistola Acutationis. Some of his arguments with Wally related to problems in securing an adequate supply of wine, the Epistola's prime ingredient. So in spite of Bloomfield's poetical indictment of Eden as a charlatan, the two alchemists were probably engaged in broadly similar activities. Each one regarded Raymond Lull as an authority, and each used the promise of the quintessence as a means of soliciting patronage. Bloomfield's own attempt to secure royal favour is preserved in another work, Bloomfield's Quintessence, a treatise written for Elizabeth I and clearly influenced by Raymond's writings. The work charmingly describes how our heaven, the quintessence, may be beautified by the stars, the metallic bodies, specifically by saturating a pound of powdered lead in spirit of wine for eight days, drawing off the quintessence and distilling it to produce an oil which, he says, hath the taste of sugar. Such a process would in fact yield sugar of lead, which we would call lead acetate, a sweet tasting yet highly toxic compound which Bloomfield hails as very medicinable for diverse infirmities of man's body. <laughs> it also offers an unusually straightforward example of a seraconian approach described in the works of Raymond and Ripley. In all of the examples that I've listed so far, the writers tend to rely quite heavily on their authorities, regurgitating rather than analysing their sources. But this kind of recycling of authoritative yet unattributed material contrasts with another attempt to discuss the vegetable stone within a patronage proposal. This is the key of alchemy written by an alchemist I've already mentioned, Samuel Norton, 1548 to 1621. Norton was the son of a Somerset gentleman, Sir George Norton, of Abbotsley near Bristol, and he claimed descent from the 15th century alchemist Thomas Norton. He wrote his Key of Alchemy in 1577 in St John's College, Cambridge, addressing it to Elizabeth I. Now, superficially, this text has quite a lot in common with Locke's treatise that I've already mentioned, in particular its reliance on the structure and contents of Ripley's medulla. It has chapters dedicated to different stones, for instance. But in the organisation and synthesis of its material, it provides a far more sophisticated treatment, offering guidance on how to make a variety of clearly delineated products. In addition to the animal, vegetable and mineral stones, Norton includes chapters on mixed and transparent stones, which later prompted one of his readers, Thomas Norton, to exclaim that the book contained, I quote, more differences of stones than ever I did read or think there had been before I had read this book. In the key, Norton took several opportunities to demonstrate to the Queen his skill at interpreting earlier authorities, notably George Ripley. For instance, he quoted a short poem attributed to Ripley, The Vision, and here's an extract. When busy at my book I was upon a certain night, the vision here expressed appeared unto my dimmed sight. A toad full rud I saw did drink the juice of grapes so fast, till overcharged with the broth, his bowels all to brast. So it's a very sad story about the toad which drinks too much, dies, and the subsequent lines uh, describe what happens to its putrefying corpse, which naturally result in the Philosopher's Stone. From this seemingly unpromising material, Norton extracts the hidden Sericonian recipe. The toad, he explains, is lead. And the juice of grapes is just that, the juice of grapes, namely vinegar. Here he says, vinegar comes of the vine and has virtue ingressive. In other words, it can penetrate the body of the lead. By the toad, he means red lead, that is adrop or minium or satin. Therefore, take the base before named, and he then goes on to give the recipe, um, noting that you have one gallon of distilled vinegar for every pound of lead. We know that he was quite serious about this interpretation because at the end of the treatise, he provided Elizabeth with a shopping list, um, basically telling her how much the work's going to cost her, giving pounds of minium and gallons of vinegar. The 
total amount comes to about £60, which must have been quite reasonable, um, given that this was a, a medicinal and transmutational recipe. Within a, few, uh, within a few decades of Norton's exegesis of this recipe, alchemical practitioners had available a wide range of alternative methods, particularly within the area of transmutational alchemy. Practitioners versed in these methods accordingly approached Seraconian texts from different directions. Now, Norton himself seems to have been perfectly clear about the identity of Sericon in his own text, its Laird or Saturn. He therefore demonstrates his own expertise to the Queen before proceeding to offer his own refinements to Ripley's earlier technique based on his own practical experience. It seems that the three stones model of alchemical practice, including the vegetable stone, was a popular one in Elizabethan England. There is little in any of the counts I've listed that would convince us that alchemists like Eden, Bloomfield, Walton or Norton took their work any less than seriously. They studied the writings of earlier authorities and left evidence of their practical engagement with these texts. In Bloomfield's case, a complete recipe collection, in Walton's, a huge compendium of alchemical texts in the Bodleian Library, Oxford, MS Ashmole 1479, which includes, as we might expect, given its influence in his own letter, a copy of Ripley's Medulla. Norton, too, was a close reader of Raymond and Ripley. These authors felt confident enough in their material that they were able to approach high-status individuals for support in their endeavours. Sometimes they also accused one another of fraud, accusations which may reflect public failure rather than a deliberate intent to mislead. Ultimately, however, it seems that none of these suits were actually successful. In the case of Bloomfield's and Norton's treatises, we have no evidence that they were ever sent, or that, if sent, Elizabeth I ever received them. Delanoy did receive substantial financial support, but reneged on his promises, and, as I've said, his story did not end happily. Yet given the sheer number of treatises which draw on the three stones approach, why do we know so little about it now? In recent years, historians of science have often focused on the transmutational aspects of alchemy, particularly on the development of different matter theories intended to explain or disprove transmutation. I would like to conclude by suggesting that the vegetable stone has fallen out of the picture due to a change in interpretation, which we can trace if we move forward from these Tudor texts into the 17th century. Some 75 years after Norton's Key was written, another exposition on Ripley's vision was written by George Starkey, 1628 to 1665. Starkey is well known in alchemical literature, both for his role in tutoring the young Robert Boyle in chemistry and for the success of alchemical works that he wrote under a pseudonym, uh, that of an American adept, Irenaeus Philolethes. Starkey produced a whole series of commentaries on George Ripley's works during the early 1650s, including one on the same vision that had previously been interpreted by Norton. But Starkey takes a very different line. Reconstructing the authentic text in its 15th century context was not, of course, his goal. His exegesis marks a strikingly different approach, both to that of Samuel Norton and probably of Ripley himself. So this is an extract from uh, Irenaeus Silalithes, the vision of Sir George Ripley Canon of Bridlington unfolded. So he begins with the toad, but for him the toad is gold rather than lead. The toad is said to drink the juice of grapes, but this is according to the philosopher. In other words, we have to read juice of grapes philosophically uh, rather than meaning wine. He's talking about the philosophical Mercury, but he's discussed in another of his works, the Introitus Apertus Ad Occlusum Regis Palatium. So here Starkey's providing an extra level of interpretation. The juice of grapes is actually a cover name, a disguise. The earlier work mentioned, the Introitus, or open entrance to the shut palace of the king, offers further clues. So a reader of this text would be well advised to go and read um, the other work, work as well. If we go and look at the Introitus Apertus, we find this description of the philosophical Mercury, uh, which of course is clear as mud, 
drawn from the chameleon of air of our physical magnesia and Caleb's magical, and so forth. Now, although this seems baffling on the surface, Starkey is here invoking the same process that he's used elsewhere in his writings, particularly in the Ripley commentaries. As the historian William Newman has shown, these repeatedly describe the reduction of antimony ore using iron to produce the star regulus of antimony. This substance, the regulus, is combined with conventional quicksilver to make the philosophical mercury, a process which also requires silver. Although Starkey often omits uh, silver from his descriptions, as in this instance here, we can't find anything that maps onto it, um, it's still possible to identify the other three ingredients in his cryptic commentary, using the introitus as our key. So the sulfurous spirit of iron that he mentioned uh, in the Vision Unfolded is actually Caleb's, the same term he uses in the introitus. While antimony, our physical magnesia, elsewhere appears as magnus, or our magnet, since it can draw the spirit out of the iron. Together, the two of them make the regulus of antimony, the chameleon, which should be circulated with quicksilver to make this, or sorry, to make a mercury that's capable of dissolving gold. This is the regulus of antimony. Often throughout his commentaries on Ripley, Starkey constructs his own riddles, distinguishing his processes using obscure language and imagery, which may be decoded by those who are well-versed in alchemical literature and practice. In the case of the vision, the riddle came ready-made. The death of Ripley's toad is completely recast as the ingression of philosophical mercury into the body of gold. Since both the seraconian and antimonial approaches require the dissolution of a metallic body in a solvent, the fatal first and tragedy of the vision's toad serves the purposes of either. While Samuel Norton's interpretation is probably the more faithful reading of Ripley, we can't really convin uh, convincingly distinguish it in terms of motives from Starkey's interpretation. In providing a commentary on the famous poem, each one of them demonstrates his ability to decipher a perplexing alchemical authority and consequently demonstrate his own fitness to propagate the art. So to conclude, alchemy offered many things to many people. From a healing stone to a gold-making elixir, from princely courts to haberdashers' shops, and from fanciful literary conceits to straightforward craft practices, alchemy was present at all levels of Elizabethan society. Far from waning, its popularity in the 17th century would only increase. The rise of Paracelsian and Helmontian chemical medicine, whose adherents challenged the Galenic orthodoxy, saw our chemical principles assimilated into mainstream medical practice. The intense interest of natural philosophers, including luminaries of the Royal Society, who saw in our chemical transformation a means of understanding the fundaments of matter, the acquisition of perfection and the mechanics of change also added to the huge increase in alchemical texts throughout the 17th century. Yet for all its evocation of authority, alchemy transformed with every new reading. The original medicinal vegetable stone was transmuted into a mineral process simply by substituting antimony for the original red lead. In this sense, transmutation was certainly possible. We began with a simple reading of the lions as red lead and vitriol. When George Ripley began to work on his own interpretation, the green lion became lead as well. And finally, with Starkey's intervention, the original red lion became antimony. Here, I think, we can see the true alchemical transmutation of metals. Thank you very much. <laughs>